Good morning to everyone, and I apologize for running a couple of minutes late. I would like to blame it on Oreo, but she actually had me up at, never mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of a number of things this morning as we begin. I'm proud of me. I, I got here. I, I wore pants. I remembered my hearing. But beyond that, I'm proud of you. Today is our food distribution. It will begin at 2. Folks assisting with it will get here at 1.30. Um, and um, I am truly amazed at what this church does. I'm also proud of the fact that this church continues to be, um, I'm not quite sure how to use the word. Uh, you will remember the, the family from Cameroon uh, who we have assisted and who has worshiped with us. We will probably be seeing less of them. Um, they have found a Cameroon community church near where they are, where, as you know, that family's English is um, in process. And the children have found friends from Cameroon that they have made at the church. And one of them um, today is today. Uh, Terry, the oldest boy, is 12. And I got a message from his mother that was very hesitant. I hope you won't be angry, but it's Terry, today's Terry's birthday, and he has lots of friends at the, the Cameroon Community Church that he wants to celebrate his birthday with. But this church has been, and will continue to be, a welcoming place for everybody. People passing through, people in need, people in the community. And, and it makes me so proud of you that that's who we are. We often can, can get discouraged and say, I don't know what we can do. We're so small. And you look around and you go, well, what do we all ready? God is using you in mighty ways. As we worship each Sunday, you will, and, and I do this periodically, I'm doing it this morning for a particular reason. I, I remind folks that the um, cloth that I use on the pulpit is from Hakka, and I'll get it later, don't worry about it. Um, from Hakka in Chin State, Burma, and that the welcome back, and that the cloth I use for a stole is also from Chin State. We want to remember. Chin State in particular, our connection to them is strong. We have a sister church in Chin State, and um, I was with Roland Van Bick this week and um, was reminded of the large number of folks who continue to be internally displaced persons. Um, and so we will remember them in prayer this morning, but we also want to remember them in our letter writing this week. Congress is um, uh, considering laws that will um, not just discourage the military junta, but will actually get more aid to the people in Burma who are suffering. Um, 
I also want to uh, make sure that I remember to tell you that the flowers this morning are in memory, memory of Mildred and Neville James, uh, given by Ray and Gail Doyle, Duty Doyle and their families. Um, now that we are all gathered, in, including me, running on Baptist time this morning, I'm going to ask that Shirley come and lead us in our opening prayer. Good morning, church family and friends. Would you please pray with me? Holy Father, we are so thankful for another week, another day, another second. Everything you give us, we are so grateful to have it. Lord God, we know we are never alone. All we have to do is trust, obey, and believe in you. You are always there for us. We get into situations, as you well know. Sometimes we wonder which way to turn, but you always, always lead us in the right direction. And we thank you so much for it. We are thankful to see people coming back into the church here. Things hopefully will continue to go better for each and every one. Lord, all we have to do is follow your footsteps, believe, and know that you are God and you are our Father. Amen. As we get ready to join in our unison call to worship, let me remind you that it is in keeping with the theme that I um, hope we will pursue this morning and have begun speaking about during the opening, that we are the handiwork of God. Um, I would remind you that handiwork is a process. We are the handiwork of God. Please stand with me as we say our call to worship in unison. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Not by works. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that in no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do.
please be seated. Our song reminds us that we are welcoming God into this place. Very often we focus ourselves on how welcome we are, and that's a good thing. But all of that is for nothing unless we welcome God here. I heard someone say once that God is a perfect gentleman, pardon the sexist language, it was years ago. He will not force himself on anyone. The Apostle Paul might have a little argument with that having been knocked on his keister on the road to Damascus. But the truth is that even there, the final choice belonged to Paul. How do we welcome God into our heart as we pray this morning? Our, I have already mentioned uh, Chen State. I raise again Cameroon and Ukraine, who, who, when I forget to mention, the reason I had Joyce do it is when I forget to mention, Joyce always says, are you angry at Cameroon? No, but I do believe that as Christians, we should be concerned about all of the places in in violence and turmoil. Um, we want to remember Carol Funkhauser uh, as she continues to recover. Uh, are there other? Yes, ma'am. And she had um, that much fluid on her lungs and she's in the hospital. The fluid's gone now, but we're just praying for recovery for baby Toledo. From the heart machine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We continue to celebrate Rodriguez family's return and especially Douglas, your recovery. And we celebrate that and thank God for it this morning. Are there others? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are there others? And we pray for today's food distribution that it will be a reflection of God's love in this community. Would you please pray with me? We feel so tiny sometimes, oh God, in the midst of the whirling turmoil and troubles of this world. So helpless, so broken, so confused. And yet, you draw us into the center of that whirlwind, 
where there is calm and peace in you and where you give us tasks to do, whether they are the task of simply speaking with a neighbor, caring for them in a time of illness, helping feed our community, praying and calling congresspersons about places in the world where our nation needs to help. All of these tasks are nothing if you are not present with us. But we believe you are. And so we bring all of our concerns to you. And we pray with your son who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. All my life you This is a time of celebration for me because I actually have some people here for the children's moments. It is good to see you. I used to know two people that looked a lot like you, but they were much shorter. You've both grown. It's good to see you. Come have a seat. And welcome back. And welcome to anybody who's watching us on Facebook or Zoom. Um, do you know what the phrase raw material means? What do you think it is? A material that's raw. Material that's raw. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, it's a phrase we use for all kinds of things. Um, the... Uh, Vegetables that go into, uh, say, a stew are called raw material, like your stuff that's raw, raw carrots, raw spinach, raw broccoli. All of it. Okay. It's also a phrase we use in uh, building things. The raw materials that go into building a house are, Dale, help me here. Raw materials that go into building a house. Wood. It's considered a raw material. It's, it's something that has not been used yet or shaped yet. Um, bowls, the raw material is clay. Um, as I've been doing blacksmithing, um, I've learned something really peculiar. Do you know what the rawest part of the raw material for steel is? No, because the metal is something before it's the metal. So it's steel, it's iron ore, and it's something sort of before that. Huh? Something sort of before that. Meteorites. Iron, and it's the same iron, by the way. This is really peculiar. It, it, it sort of knocked my socks off. It's the same iron that falls from the sky in a meteorite that makes up a huge percentage of the core of the earth and that is in every plant and every animal. The folks out here, we won't, we won't laugh at them because you'd be laughing at me too, but many of them remember a 
uh, commercial about a medicine called Geritol. For people our age with iron poor blood, literally, our body needs a certain amount of iron to be healthy. And it's the same iron that I pound on an anvil. It's a raw material. And the trick is, how do we use it? Okay, you follow me so far? You and I are God's raw material. God takes us and works with our lives to turn us into what he wants. And what he wants is friends, children. God wants us to be God's friends and to help him make the world better. We are God's raw material. And I think that's kind of cool until I think of myself as being hammered on an anvil and then I go, hmm. But God sometimes shapes us. God takes parts of our lives and well, let me give you an example. Have you ever been bullied? Have you ever, have, ever had anybody bully you? Oh, good. I did when I was small. We get angry at that, but God takes that and shapes it and makes us concerned about people who are bullied, like we were, or that we don't like to see, and takes that energy and makes us helps us protect others. Can you see how that might happen? So God is using the raw material of our lives to make something that God called, Jesus called the kingdom of God. So even when it's something we go, that couldn't be worth much, like a meteor. Woof. Oh, a big rock fell from the sky. It is raw material that when it is melted into ore and worked with as iron and you add carbon and it becomes steel and all those happy things, becomes the raw material for something good. You, like the Bible verse we read, are God's handiwork just like I might make a bowl out of clay and say, look what I made. God is working with you to make something beautiful. And you were already beautiful, but God is going to make you more so. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for using us as your raw material. Shape us and help us grow in your name. Amen. Please stand up and turn around. Say hello to someone near you. Offer them the peace of God. And to the people joining us on, the fa on Facebook, the peace of God be with you. And to everyone, the peace of God be with you. Joyce, would you come and bless our offering this morning? Father God, thank you for providing for us every day. Thank you, Lord, for providing enough that we can give some back, that it can be used for your glory and for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise 
you're seated. We are God's raw material. I, I, I may have told you this fable once before. If I have, I don't apologize because it's one of my favorites. It, it seems that once upon a time there was a blacksmith and he had decided to make a rose. Probably a much better iron rose than the one I showed you during children's moments some time back, but this blacksmith was a master blacksmith, and he was going to make an iron rose. And as he was working on the anvil, the rose spoke of him no more. What? Well, I like the idea of being a rose. I think roses are pretty, and I think they're artistic, and I love the idea. But I don't like your hand hammer, and I don't like your anvil, and I can do this myself. The blacksmith said, okay, and walked away. And the Iron giggled to itself and began to jump up and down on the anvil. Now the iron at that point was hot, and because it was jumping up and down on the anvil, it did indeed shape the iron, but not in the way it wanted. And as it cooled, it no longer could shape, and finally it lost its balance and went over the edge of the anvil and landed in a cold clump of iron on the floor. Now the good news in this fable is that iron can be reworked. The blacksmith can come back, place it into the fire, and rework it. Now, I want to read you two stories. One is from 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, the first through the seventh verses. Now, Elisha was a prophet in Israel, and apparently there were a company of what were known as sons of the prophets, and that meant they were uh, disciples of the prophet. They were junior prophets. They were prophets in training, or they were simply, Elisha was the head prophet. Now, the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, and is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But a creditor has come to take my two son children as slaves. Now, I want to stop here for a second because uh, I think in many, in many ways it's a wonderful story, but uh, you got to wonder, how come in this whole company of prophets, nobody noticed that this poor woman was in debt? When did the debt start? We don't know. Did it start with her husband who amassed debt somehow before he died? Did it start after her husband's death? There, there, there is a real problem here because if you look back at Torah, loaning money at an interest rate was forbidden. But somehow folks had forgotten this, and the creditor did was going to do what 
the creditor could do, which was to say, okay, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to take your two children, I'm going to sell them as slaves, and I'll get whatever I can get for them, and it will pay back your debt. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not just a few. And then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into all these vessels and when each is full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. And they kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring. I think it's a wonderful picture, by the way. Now, we don't know how old her children were, but can you imagine? Henry and Douglas bringing pots to Mama. And Mama keeps pouring oil into them. They run and they get another pot and they bring it. And they, she keeps pouring. And finally she says to them, bring me another pot. And her son says to her, there are no more. And then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, meaning Elisha, and he said, go and sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your children can live on the rest. The raw material of this story is three things. See, you're going to get part of a three-point sermon. The oil in the house. Her crying out to God, to Elisha. And the faith that came with that cry that something could be done. Now, like I said, there's some problems for me with this story, but, but I... I that's not one of them. If we are going to be God's raw material for building the kingdom, whatever little bit of oil we have left, you may be thinking this morning, I'm down to next to nothing. And, and, and she could have said, look, I, I don't know what you're doing, Elisha, but that's not a whole lot of oil, and I want to keep it. What, what, what might have happened? There's a faith that cries out in brutal honesty. And often we do not get to it until we are totally broken. Till our life is in utter ruin. There she is, whatever the reason for the debt, she's about to lose her children. And she comes to Elisha and she makes a demand. She says, Look, you know that my son, my husband, feared the Lord. There's what she's saying is there's absolutely no reason for you not to help me here. But I am at my wit's end. I do not know what to do. She also could not have done this without her neighbors. Now think, stop and think about that for just a minute. What if she'd gone knocking on doors and said, look, can I borrow a vessel from you for just a little bit? And they said, you know what? I know you're already in trouble. 
And that means I don't know whether I'll get my vessel back from you. I mean, you're already in debt and they're banging on your door wanting to collect the bills. And why should I do anything for you? You obviously are not part of the deserving poor. She needed the help of her neighbors. But she also had to open herself up for this miracle to happen. I mean, that's a pretty weird thing when you think about it. I mean, you know, if, if, if I came to you and said, look, I am terribly in debt. Um, that Maserati I bought last week, my trip to Europe with my family, and the airplane that I have written off on my taxes as part of my ministry. I won't tell you which evangelist that sounds like, but we'll let that one go. And I said to you, I don't know what I'm going to do, but um, the Board of Trustees has told me that I should take an offering plate and put what I have in it and then start pouring that into buckets. Can I borrow a bucket from you? I can, okay. But you'd look at me right smart. You'd go, that price is weird, but if he wants a bucket, I like him. I'll give him a bucket. Yet, trusting even the strange, maybe not to be understood, commands of God at a particular time may help us to become raw material. I want to read you another story. It's from the book of Mark, and it's told in other scriptures, but I happen to really like Mark's telling of this story, and I will tell you why in a moment. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught, and he said to them, come away with me to a deserted place and let's rest. Because many were coming and going, and they had, they had the disciples hadn't even had a chance to sit down and eat. This is in Mark 6, beginning with verse 30, if you're following in your Bible. Now many saw them going and recognized them until they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. This is after Jesus sent out his disciples and they'd done all these wonderful miracles and they came back to Jesus and Jesus says, let's go away and rest. When he went ashore, they'd gotten on the boat and they crossed the shore. See, He saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. It was time to rest, but the truth was, he, he, he looked at these people and they had such need. So he began to teach. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. Note that this is a deserted place. The hour is very late. Send these people away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy something for themselves to eat. Tell them we're taking a break. We'll be back after dinner. There's a McDonald's over here and a Burger King over here and an Arby's, if you eat that, is over there. And Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. They looked out at the community around them in Hyattsville, and they saw the hunger, and they saw the need, and they said to God, make these people go away. Create some vast government system to feed them. Do something. This bothers us. And Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. 
And they said, how are we going to go and do that? It would take 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat. And he said to them, how many loaves have you got? Go and see. And when they found out, they came back and they said, we've got five loaves and two fish. Now, in other renditions of this story, what we're told is there was a lad, a little boy, who had five loaves and two fish. And when I was in Sunday school as a little boy, we were always told about his mama packing his lunch for him so he could go off and listen to Jesus. And that's wonderful. And we were told how wonderful it was that he offered what he had. And that is true. But this is the reason I chose Mark's passage. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green, green grass. Big deal. I've had a picnic in the park too. This is a desert place. The green grass. And by the way, Mark does not talk that way. Mark, many of the other gospels are very descriptive, right? Mark's like uh, Jack Webb and Dragnet, if you remember that. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. When Mark says, Mark, Mark never will say, and Jesus stood before them in his new brown robe and his leather sandals, the blue sky above him in the back. That's not Mark. So what's going on here? What's going on is Mark knows the truth of the prophecies about the Messiah that when the Messiah comes, the desert will bloom. And they all ate. And there was food left over. You are the raw material of the kingdom of God. What do we have? Well, we've got a lady who dropped off a jar of jelly, three cans of, of, of tuna, and someone who helped us find some fresh produce. kingdom of God is present. Now this little boy, if he was, had become cynical enough, you know, maybe he'd heard his daddy say to him, you got to look out for yourself, son, and other people to take care of themselves. If they don't have enough, it's their own problem. This little boy the lady with the bag and the chicken. You and I, everyone who has contributed to the food bank that will be giving food today. We are the raw material for the kingdom of God. We have to be willing to be shaped. We have to not decide, go away to the, to the blacksmith. We can do this ourselves. We have to risk. And God will set our community, our world, down on the green, green grass that signals the presence of the kingdom of God 
and the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This is no accident. This is no government program. This is the coming of the kingdom of God in small but powerful ways because you have opened yourselves up to be used. I am amazed every time I see this happen. Every time we come together for a food distribution, every time people welcome someone who is passing through on their way from somewhere where they were unwanted or in danger, every time Prayers are answered every time someone says, um, this is my first time here, but my neighbor who was so kind to me said this was a good place. But we get to choose. I'm real fond of that image of iron and the truth that is hidden in it. And you will hear about it again because it's an image I'm just playing with, started playing with this week. So we're going to be. But think about it. What if love, not Ooh, that's a nice song. I think she's beautiful. He's beautiful. I'm in love. But love for neighbor. Love for God. Is the iron in our world. What if that is the ingredient that makes the kingdom possible. We don't have to build it, but we are its raw material. Please pray with me. Oh God, cure our fear of being hammered Cure our fear of the fire that will make us malleable. We open ourselves to you so that on the green, green grass of the blooming desert at the table of the Messiah, we can all sit down and be fed. Amen. Our closing hymn is a new piece of music, so we will learn it this morning. Please stand. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I While I was a slave to sin, 
Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, all is free in me. I'm a child. You who have been set free, go from this place and allow yourselves to be the raw materials of the kingdom of God, strengthened by the knowledge that in the goodness of God you were born. By the watchfulness of God, we are kept all day long. And in the love and mercy of God, we are all being redeemed and made whole. My heart shall sing of the day we bring up the fires of your justice, Lord. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Before you go, uh, during our service this morning, many of you have who have been at um, devotional um, are aware of the Morabito family who is from um, Heritage Baptist in Annapolis where I was uh, the interim for a while. Mike Morabito is having surgery tomorrow on a broken leg and a torn ankle. I don't know why. If I know Mike, he got thrown from a boat. He, he's, he's a big engineer. He goes out and tests things um, and on occasion has been launched for distance. Um, but I will find out. But please, his wife, Amanda, sent us a message and asked us to pray for him this morning. And so please remember Mike Morabito in your prayers this week, and the peace of God be with you.